Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session. Today we will talk about spatial displays. Displays are very important in general life and also particularly on the system because they provide information about the status of a system. They can provide information about what to do next and they can be different kinds of displays. So we will be looking at particularly the visual displays which because most of the information that we receive from our world about 80 percent of the information comes through the visual modality. Now just to recapitulate what we have done, we have looked at the compatibility principles because if the systems are designed following certain compatibility principles, systems as well as their components, then performance gets enhanced, accuracy of performance and also the speed of performance. And then selective attention plays a very critical role because uh, in various cognitive tasks, particularly in attentional, perceptual and sensory processes, uh, visual attention is important, auditory attention is important. And then finally, uh, visual search is largely serial and self-terminating. So it takes time to find out what is there in a gamut of objects. And these objects can be, for example, any information that is available on a display. So after today's session, it will be possible to describe different types of displays, state guidelines to design visual display and how the cognitive stages of information processing that is sensory, perceptual, working memory, memory, uh, they influence the reading of visual displays uh, because reading means how to get information, whatever is out there in the form of symbols, printed messages or whatever have we, they can be of different types. So what is a display? A display is a method of presenting information indirectly because direct information we may not be able to achieve system, it may be hazardous for example to reach near the system or it may be difficult because many processes might be going on and presenting all information in one place is always advantageous, it will be quick process, processing of information. So this information can either be reproduced in, in, an, in a coding form, uh, which coding may be in the form of symbols for example, but symbols have their specific meanings in the specific context. Now displays can be quant classified in terms of the sensory modality through which information is received, so it can be visual, auditory or tactual modality, as I said largely we receive information through the visual modality and that is what this session will focus on. Their form can be analog, digital or hybrid. So a particular display may present uh, information in both forms. For example, if you look at a wristwatch uh, where you know a, there is a moving pointer on a dial but at the same time date is given in a digital form. So this is a hybrid kind of uh, display. Uh, so wristwatch indicates the time. Then nature. Displays can be static or dynamic. Static means the values are constant, they don't change. And, but they may be required for a certain reference. For example, tables of statistical distributions. Those tables are available where specific sampling distributions are provided and we can find out probability of a certain value of the statistic uh, on that distribution. And medium can be print or electronic generally. There can be other media, for example, there may be engravings on stones, etc., and various other forms, plates, for example, copper plates may be used on which the information may be engraved. And the information may be quantitative or qualitative. We have already talked about this distinction between quantitative and qualitative information. So quantitative means in terms of numbers with which we can do certain things. Uh, we can add, multiply, subtract, divide. 
And qualitative means we can know certain ranges within which the system should be performing or is performing. So that is a slight distinction, but we look at this distinction more clearly when we talk about quantitative and qualitative displays. This is only in one particular type. There can be combination of these uh, different possible combinations of modality, form, nature, and medium. For example, if we look at a map, then a printed map, for example, is a static analog representation of the directions between various landmarks in the place of which this map is or to which this map refers. And then, uh, however, distances between two landmarks can be computed, but that will require some kind of computations. Uh, mentally, it may not be possible always, but uh, distances can be obtained. So, so whereas direction is a qualitative variable and distance is a quantitative variable. So it is possible to infer, and that may not be exact, but to some extent that can be done. And there are certain procedures by which quantitative information can be put in a qualitative form and from qualitative by some computation, not always, but in some cases we can do that. An electronic version of the map may provide qualitative as well as a quantitative information in the window. For example, that generally happens. So distances are also recorded uh, when, for example, uh, GPS, when we use GPS, then directions are given and also roughly uh, time to reach or distance uh, that may be there uh, between the present position and the target destination <coughs> that can be provided. So this just to give an example of a map. Here we can see that direction is represented uh, on a map and uh, this is, for example, north direction upward. So if we are facing, normally that is how maps are presented, north is always face front. Then on our right hand side is the east, left hand side is the west, and the back side is south. So now we know these directions, and roughly we can say that if we are in this position, then this position is roughly toward the northeast. So if you want to go from Rura to Sholi, then we'll have to move in the northeast direction. And similarly, we'll have to move northward if we have to go from Rura to Asalaganj. So these directions are clearly there. Now how to get distances from these? Now generally displays should be such that they require minimal mental effort and minimal computations. Therefore, the best will be done if a table is presented along with this map. Generally, sometimes the railway timetables do that. They present a map of the railway track, and they also present a table where the different times at which the train would reach particular stations that is provided. So the information is presented in a dual form. But here, if we want to get a rough idea, <coughs> we can use scales. Generally, a scale is provided. Here it is written, for example, map not to scale. Because actual distances will be much more, and this is just a qualitative representation. And as I said, generally maps are created to give us the directional information. But if a mapping scale is provided, sometimes it is written, for example, uh, one centimeter represent 50 kilometer. If that is the scale, then I can measure the distance between Rura and Asalaganj. And if that is 3 centimeters, then I get the answer as 150 kilometer. That means that is not the actual distance, but I am just assuming that that is our scale. Now, normally, the track, this is now the direct Euclidean distance. And it is possible that in between there are houses, blocks, and we cannot directly walk. Therefore, this is not really the moving distance. But this can give an aerial distance. But if I want the moving distance, I need a more detailed map where the roads are provided. And I, if I assume that they are rectangular in nature for each segment of that road, I can calculate the distance using this particular uh, transformation. And then I can get the distances. But then that, as we see, this is a very involved kind of exercise and requires a lot of mental effort, computations. and 
in most situations, when a system is running, for example, we want to use the information immediately. And therefore, we want information on which we can act, rather than uh, inferring more deeper insight into how the system is performing, we would like that information in that way. Therefore, but maps have their, their utility, and in a simple form, a large amount of information can be presented. Whereas if we wanted to create a table, a table will be long, and then of course, table will also have to be scanned and distances can be found out between various combinations of locations or landmarks. So uh, <coughs> processing of displays employ sensory, perceptual, attentional, working memory stages, all stages of the information processing model. And because the information is coming in, and then we are attending to it and then processing it somehow and reaching a conclusion, decision, or process, after processing the information, we know what to do. We take an action. At the same time, long-term memory can also influence how we process that information because of our familiarity. If we are familiar with the situation, for example, an operator who has been working on a system for long, the operator knows the, what different positions of the pointer on the scale. For example, if there's a moving pointer on a scale, fixed scale, then the operator knows in general that these positions of the pointer are normal positions or they are deviating from the normality. And therefore, the operator may take a decision accordingly, do something or do nothing, depending on what is the position of the pointer. So that is familiarity. Uh, one has to be familiar with the system. If one is not familiar with the system, the meaning will not be possible. So guidelines for display design should give due consideration to the classification of displays and the information processing stages. So whether a display is qualitative, quantitative, digital, analog, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of modality and other criteria, and along with that, what stage of information processing is involved in processing information from that particular delay? They display that. Those uh, will provide us the basis for developing guidelines for uh, different displays. So the sensory stage in processing visual displays, uh, you know, are say, uh, let's say I. How does the I, I say visual? We are talking about visual information. One is visual acuity. Most of us are aware of visual acuity, but shortly we'll see this. Uh, then convergence, or phoria, and color discrimination, and dark adaptation. Now, if we look at the eye, then uh, you know this is a simple diagram of the basic components of eye. Uh, we are not worried about the physiology and other kinds of aspects. All we are saying is that in the eye, there are cones uh, which are located centrally. Most of the cones, so this area is densely populated by cones. And as we go outside the central area, then uh, rods are there. And if an image is projected on the cones, it will be sharp. It will be clearly seen. And therefore, most of the times, the operator will try to look at the display so that the image is projected on the fovea and there is a clear vision, clear view, information can be obtained without any distortion. Now, because there are two eyes, then if the, uh, generally with two eyes we can see depth, a depth perception is possible. So with two eyes, if they converge on the same point, and if the images are projected on corresponding areas in the two eyes, we say there is a good view. So this is convergence. Convergence does that. Through convergence, we achieve the projection of the image of a particular object or point in space in the corresponding positions on the two eyes. And that is uh, what we want. But if that does not happen, then there is phoria. So phoria is the absence of uh, the result of convergence. And therefore, if there are two different images that are formed on areas which are not corresponding to each other, then uh, there is phoria. And then color discrimination. Color discrimination should be good. Because if the color discrimination is not good, then for the operator it will be 
difficult to assess uh, the situation in dark adaptation. Uh, in many places, operators have to work under dark conditions and if they are outside, they have to come in. So how long will it take to adapt to the uh, dark room or dark place where the system is located? That can also influence. So now, let's go into visual acuity. Visual acuity uh, is also called minimum separable acuity, which means what is the separation between two points minimum separation or two lines, so they can be seen as separate and about, it's about one second of solid angle. So if uh, two objects are within one second of that solid angle, uh, visual equity will not be there. For normal eye, for example, uh, that is the visual equity. Now, equity can be measured and generally we are aware of uh, how the acuity is measured in the med for medical diagnostic purposes. For example, if there is a vision, you know, myco myopia or other kinds of problems, hypermetropia or whatever, then uh, it is, it becomes important to assess the visual acuity of the individual. And generally, a Sennel chart is used for that purpose. Where uh, 20 by 20 is considered as a normal vision. This means that a normal eye can see that size of the written text or projected text from 20 feet distance. From So the size which can be seen at 20 feet distance by a normal eye, then we call the eye as 20 by 20. But if there is a problem with the distance vision, then suppose there is something like 2070. That means if a normal eye can see the object clearly at a distance of 70 feet, then the person who is having some problem uh, can see it at 20 feet. So the distance will have to be reduced for any problem with the eye vision. So this is how the medical diagnosis is done. And this is, uh, you know, generally it can be understood how, for example, at various degrees of vision from the central location, from the foveal region, how the photopic uh, vision is affected and it goes down. And therefore, the best uh, vision is there when the image is projected at almost the central location, where the, uh, uh, in the fovea, where cones are located with a heavy density. Now, based on this kind of measurement, then we know that a certain power of the lens is determined. And this is a good reference to see and will auto guide where it says that if the central chart says, say, 20 by 120, then you need a lens of about 1.7 diopters. And we know diopters is the reverse, inverse of the focal length. So, uh, you know, the ophthalmist can find out uh, what particular lens is to be provided for such an eye. So, this is how, you know, the visual acuity works. Now, what are the conditions that affect visual discrimination? There are various conditions, and therefore, they should be ensured that in the room where a display is located, visual display, then conditions are met. One is luminous contra contrast. Luminous contrast should be high, OK, uh, between the object and the background. Object here in the case of display are the, uh, say, digits or the markers that are present on the Display. So, if there is a circular display, for example, a wristwatch, then we know uh, it is written 12, 9, 3, 6, and 9. And then there is a pointer moving across. And then there are markers for minor positions. Sometimes uh, these digits are not written, but there are indications by markers which are larger in size than the minor markers. So, basically, if the luminance between the markers and the background, for example, 
if we use uh, light blue background and slightly darker markers, it will be very difficult to contrast the two positions. So, color, illumination level in terms of intensity or luminance, etc., they become important. So, to increase the contrast, uh, this can be used, you know, that how much contrast do we want? We can use the relationship between the luminance of the object and the background and get accordingly uh, this thing. Then amount of illumination, clear visibility of the display should be there, illumination should be at such a level. Uh, we have looked at what are the different illumination levels required in one of the earlier lectures and uh, those guidelines are available. Then exposure time, what will be the exposure time? Will it sometimes you know a digital information may appear for a very brief duration, right? Or uh, we may be in a moving situation and the display has to be uh, read in a very short time. So exposure time, larger the exposure time, easier it will be for the individual to read the display, but shorter the exposure time, it will be more difficult. And particularly, you know, for example, in digital displays or other uh, where large number of numerals are presented on the display, it will be difficult to read the value if you don't want exact value accurate value or precise value. Then luminance ratio between two areas in the visual field. Uh, the brighter one gets more attention. So for example, if we make the dial brighter, much brighter as compared to the pointer, we actually want to see where the pointer is directed, where in particular location is it oriented at a particular time or in the process somewhere. Then uh, we would like the pointer to be brighter than the background. Then movement, dynamic visual acuity deteriorates rapidly as the rate of motion exceeds 60 degrees per second. So if there's a moving display and suppose you, we are looking in a particular direction, then from there if the display moves such that the angular speed is uh, more than 60 degrees per second, uh, then there will be problem. Glare should not be there, a lot of work has been done on human computer interaction. Initially when you know these uh, computers were coming in, uh, what should be the illumination in the room so that the key code does not present the glare or the monitor does not present the glare. So that became a very important area, a lot of research is available there. So glare, glare should be uh, absent and anti-glare or anti-glaze glasses are sometimes used for that purpose or screens may be used so that uh, glare can be avoided. Then a combination of uh, these variables can they interact in various ways and therefore an appropriate combination of these variables is to be found for particular uh, displays. In what situations will that particular display will be used? For example, we use mobile phone in various situations. We may use it in the dark room, we may use it in sunlight, etc. And as the illumination outside changes, what will be the effect on uh, the vision that we will have of the display on the cell phone screen. So visual displays can be quantitative, qualitative, they can indicate a status, uh, they can be signal and warning lights, they can be representational, alphanumeric, uh, and visual code symbols and signs, and then some general guidelines about each one of them. Each, for each one of them, we require specific guidelines. Now this is an example of quantitative displays and a lot of work has been done long ago on quantitative displays and various kinds of display designs have been investigated. For example, uh, there is you know, fixed scale moving pointer type displays. Here a pointer moves in a rotary way like that for example or like that in a decreasing value or increasing value and the uh, dial is arranged so that the normal position if we want some normal position is at at the top say 0 here or it can be 0 somewhere you know it can be arranged. So these are all these are fixed scale moving pointer types of displays. This is a 
semicircular half window kind of display. So, circular scale with positive and negative values, semicircular or curved scale, and then here positive and negative values are given. So, sometimes we may want there is, there is a normal position where uh, we set the normal position in such a way that the parameter values do not given, given, don't get positive or negative and therefore, the pointer should always be around in this place. And uh, we represent a zone which might be some zone uh, where system will never reach or whatever. Then there are linear scales and they can be vertical or horizontal. So, these uh, are called quantitative because they provide information about the quantitative values of a variable. They provide us the value say we can read it as 85 here. Now, how do these designs pair? Uh, some research that was done by Chapnis, uh, you know, so because different type, types of tasks have to be performed on the displays. We will see what kind of those tasks are particularly when we talk about graphical representations. Different tasks may be performed. We may, for example, uh, want to look at a display and then uh, compare the value on the display with some standard value or something like that. So, there is a moving pointer type scale and there is a, a moving scale type display. Here, you know, the dial moves rather so and pointer is in a fixed position and there is a digital display, a counter. So, these are analog displays and there is a digital display and then they have been compared. So, if you want a quantitative reading, then the digital display is the best. If you want precise value, then digital display is the best. But for check reading, setting and tracking, if you have to track an object, moving object for example, we have looked at the tracking task while talking about information theory, where we have talked about the Fitz law, uh, about the movement time and index of difficulty. So, the moving pointer type of scales are best over a large number of such tasks. Digital is good, is also comparable, particularly for this task, but digital is best here for quantitative reading. And moving scale type really do not fare well. In fact, uh, for check, checking a reading, uh, this has a very negative, because we talked about familiarity with certain kind of experience with a particular display when it is a moving pointer type, then various play display locations, they are in the long term memory of the operator and this is familiarity and this influences a top down processing is there and this influences the accurate reading. Then what are the general guidelines for designing uh, quantitative displays? They can be digital or open window, right? When values remain long enough to read, then use digital or open window. Fixed scale moving pointer is preferable to moving pointer fixed scale design. So, this we have already seen that here this is not faring well the moving scale type design is not faring well. Then uh, for long scales, moving scale with tape on spools behind panel, sometimes for example, the number of values that we may have to read on a display may be larger in number and it may be uh, difficult to accommodate them on a circular dial or even in a long scale, you know, this may have a limited span because after all, we cannot create a very long or horizontally in a larger span that scale. So, it is possible to use a tape which moves uh, in the window and on that tape various values are ished and then they can be read because whenever whatever value comes near a pointer that can be read easily. But the range should be available because normally what happens is these nearby values they provide some kind of a cue and they are quite helpful in accurate reading. If they are not there uh, with a with an analog scale, it will be difficult to read the precise value. So, better value can reading can be done if these, these 
side queues are there. And if values change continuously, display all of the range, entire range should be presented in one place because as sometimes you know the values may change continuously up, down, and then the entire scale should be available so that a comparative inference can be drawn by the operator. Then integrated display to present two or more items of related information. Uh, we'll look at an example of integrated display when we go to graphs. Smallest scale you need to be used should be, markers should be at least 0 0.05 inch away from each other so that, you know, there's some kind of the acuity, it should be uh, not mer get merged. Use marker for each scale unit unless scale has to be very small. So here, uh, the markers have been used for scale, each scale unit. So we can read up to, uh, say, 10.1, 10.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, uh, sorry, 15, 11, 12, 13. So one unit can be read on this scale. So uh, this is, you know, we, are, we don't write for every marker, we don't write the value because that will be too much of a clutter. But then these values will indicate what are those, what are the values on that, the, those minor markers. Then preferred markers are 1, 2, 3, 4, continuous. That's always better because this progression system is easy to read, understand. But if there's a large number of values, so for example, if you want to go to from, uh, from 0 to 100, then using 0 to 100 on such a scale will be uh, very cluttered and therefore the values may be used in the range of 10. Now these are examples of qualitative visual displays. So qualitative visual display either provide a status or so uh, they provide different ranges. Uh, for example, there's a yellow color here and a green color here and then a red color here, and green color may be considered as okay, acceptable, or problem, whatever is the meaning of that range. And here it is, if we want to maintain certain desirable range <coughs> for a speedometer, for example, which is measuring miles per hour. A speedometer is used to maintain the speed of the moving vehicle. And then there can be the trend or rate of change where the RPM, revolutions per minute of the engine uh, speed and et cetera, that is indicated. And if this goes up and down, it indicates that the RPM is changing. And Or if it is increasing at a certain rate, then it is increasing at a certain rate. So these uh, qualitative displays, nevertheless, the qualitative ranges are based on some quantitative information. So quantitative information is not to be read from these displays. They are just there to indicate that as a memory, as anchors. But the basic idea is to read whether the information is within the desirable range or not in terms of the status of the system, that system is, is running fine. So if my pointer is, say, for example, uh, within this range, then running fine. But the moment it goes to the red, red range, the problem, and before that, there's a yellow sign indicating, giving a signal that probably it is now going to the risky region. So general guidelines for qualitative scales, prefer fixed scale with moving pointers, right? And then for groups, use circular scales. If a large number of qualitative scales are to be used, then it's always a good idea so that the, the normal position is in the, either in the nine o'clock position so suppose we want the temperature to be in a certain range. And so we put the scale such that the normal temperature is here. This may be 40 degrees, doesn't matter, and then zero starts somewhere. But suppose we want the humidity to have a certain value, which may have a value of say, uh, we don't want it to go beyond uh, 20 percent. Then we put, the, for humidity, we put 20 here. And then 
uh, zero may be here. So it is not necessary that we align these displays in terms of their zero position. What is important is to see that all pointers are pointing in the same direction. If the system on all parameters is normal, because if we arrange in such a manner that they were organized as their zeros were here, then for temperature the uh, you know the pointer may be in that direction. For humidity, the pointer may be in that direction, and that will create a clutter and it will be difficult to really see in one view whether the system is running normal on all the parameters. So this is what is the information that we derive from here. Now these are status indicators, hot, cold, on off indicator, traffic lights on various systems we have on off indicators. Traffic lights, they also provide the status, traffic moving, traffic, traffic, traffic static, etc, etc. And guideline is basic data represent discrete independent categories or basically quantitative data are always used in terms of such categories use display that represents each. For example, this is the knob on, a, on an iron. And uh, here there are five categories, you know, for what kind of fabric is it? Is it a nylon or a silk or a wool or a linen? And for linen you need a very high temperature. So everything is marked here and then we can set it. So the setting can be done and therefore we can maintain uh, certain, the, uh, we can maintain uh, certain desirable range once we do that. And then there will be an indicator light. Indicator light would mean that system is still preparing itself to reach that category wherever it has been fixed. And once it reaches there, then this light will go off. So now we are using a combination of two different displays. Of course, this display is also the uh, this display is also the control mechanism. So uh, then there are signals and warning lights. Signal and warning lights indicate status of a system or its part, uh, say blinking, steady lights, warning indication, etc. And uh, here in the in this uh, you know traffic lights at a given moment is suppose the traffic light is green it says what is the status of the traffic and the moment it shifts to orange or yellow then it's a signal that now the system is going to change and we know that if it is already uh, traffic is moving it will become static. So if we are driving and we are nearing a, a crossing, this signal will warn us, will prepare us for the action and we will stop. And similarly in the opposite direction. So this is uh, you know, a low battery indicator. These are all signal and warning lights. What are the uh, guidelines? Minimum size used must be consistent with luminance and exposure time. What should be the size of that you know, blinking bulb or light that we are using. With low signal to background contrast, red light is more visible, uh, you know, because of their web. We have already looked at uh, various uh, entire range of wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum where the eye sensitivity is highest. So go back to one of the earlier lectures. And flash rate of uh, flashing lights of 1 to 10 per second presumably can be detected by people. If the flash rate is higher than that, then there is some, some uh, process whereby uh, the uh, it will become a continuous exposure and this called uh, flicker frequency fusion so if uh, the rate is less than 10 per second it will appear like flickering but if it becomes 20 or 30 per second it will not appear like flickering so we want flicker if we want it to if we want to use a light as a signal or a warning, then uh, we want to use it as a flicker, not as a constantly glowing light. Then representational displays, 
they present pictorial or symbolic information about TV screen, uh, cathode ray display, aircraft position display, and GPS display. Now, general guidelines are uh, simple. Uh, depict a moving element against a fixed background. So, if we are showing an aircraft, then the background should not change. Only the aircraft should be sh shown to be moving. Prefer line graphic display over bar to depict trends. Line, we'll look at that when we come to the graphs. Use schematic representation for displays depicting complex configurations, such as traffic routes and wiring. Uh, don't add uh, numbers or any symbols, etc., because that will clutter the presentation. But uh, if that is essential, then in critical positions, that information may be provided or added, or there may be additional manuals which may be provided. Then alphanumeric displays, uh, we know them. Their considerations are typography, font type, aspect ratio, height to width, and stroke width. Stroke width, a lot of research has been done in these areas, and it will be a good idea to go through that research. Then color, contrast, and background, uh, visibility, legibility, readability. All of these influence how we look, how we see information in the alphanumeric displays. General guidelines, uh, typographic, as has been talked about, present alphanumeric characters in groups of three. So if you want to give your telephone number, then 8 to 5, 389, 2 to 6, 4, whatever you want to say. And so in groups of three, that helps in memorizing because, because when you present it in groups of three, you are forming three chunks of information. And a chunk is an abridged, abridged uh, representation of a larger amount of information. Most accurate reading capital letters and numerals is possible uh, when height, uh, the, the stroke width to height is about 1 is to 6, or et cetera, et cetera. These guidelines are also important. So what should be the relative height uh, and width of the alpha neutrine characters? So height should be larger than the width. And uh, when the width is at least 2 thirds the height. So uh, generally, you know, uh, representations of that kind, they appear better, they are easy to read as representation compared to that kind. So where height is less, this is easier, uh, and this is problematic. Then general guide is in symbolic displays, figure ground, relationship. The fi figure means the characters should stand out. Then figure boundaries, closure, simplicity, unity. Uh, we have talked about some of these principles, perceptual principles, in the one of the earlier lectures. Now there are three different graph formats, and graph are gra graphs are something which most of the people use to represent information in business, in um, any organization where they want to study, for example, the growth of the organization or production uh, or attrition rate, for example. Uh, different systems uh, might be there. So here, suppose uh, we are looking at some information on the footfalls, monthly footfalls, monthly change in footfalls. And suppose you know there's a company which started two showrooms at the same time. So I have not written any uh, month, particular month here. All I am saying is in the first month, second month, third month. And then this information, so there are two units, unit A and unit B. And uh, then uh, we measure the footfalls in each unit. And then what we find is that we can either represent this information in the form of uh, bar chart or a line diagram, line graph or in the form of pie charts. So pie charts tell us, as we can see, uh, that uh, this from first month to second month to third month, there's an increase. But by what, what amount, how much, this information isn't there. This information is here, but then uh, you know, continuity and uh, there's, the comparison is not possible. Whereas in a line graph, a large amount of information is present in a single display where we are talking about what is happening every month and what is the number in each month, we can get that. Then what is happening in each unit. So we can compare units, we can compare monthly 
rise, we can see the trend. The trend can be immediately seen in the line graph. And most importantly, it is the proximity compatibility principle we talked about in the principles of compatibility. Proximity compatibility principles means that the whatever information we want to present, then those elements are presented together as close physically as close to each other as possible. And line graph just does that, by which complex comparisons and high task proximity uh, and the high task proximity can be made, complex comparisons can be made. So what are the different tasks that people do? Point reading. How many footfalls did you need to be registered during the second month? So you want to do that, we can see that it's very easy here, it's question mark here, and to some extent, it can be read here also. But then we'll have to see first what is unit B, then look at that color, and then see the number. But in the line graph, the entire information is integrated in one graph. And immediately, I can go to unit B and see that value. It's faster. It's faster. So <clears throat> then local comparisons. Did you need to register more footballs in the third month? Of course, here where we can see third month, but again, we'll see line graph is much easier. Global comparisons. During the first three months, did unit A register more football than unit B during the same period? So now it is between two units. And again, line graph will probably do it. Synthesis. Did the footballs increase at a higher rate in unit A? This is now a more complex comparison. And again, we can compare which is the best graph. So graph guideline, consider the task. What is the task to be performed? Minimize the number of mantle operations. We've already talked about it while discussing the map. Use physical dimensions judged without bias. Keep the data ink ratio high and code multiple graphs consistently. So just quickly to go through these, what are the benefits of using particular graph for various tasks? Point reading, this is also called localization. Low physical compatibility, a bar chart can be done. Local, if the physical compatibility is low, then bar chart. Local or simple comparisons, bar chart, pie chart. Local means only for that particular unit. Global, so we have already talked about these, this distinction. So for global comparison, or complex, high proximal compatibility line graph. And synthesis, synthesis means on the basis of the available information in the graphs, we make some inferences. So synthesis is also sometimes called creativity. So we want to create, we want to be creative. We can, we want to find out relationships across uh, various units and over the years, over the months. Then number of mental operations, visual search, perception, and computations can be time consuming and affect performance. The designer should keep in mind two things. Choose an appropriate graph type, depending on the task. So first identify the task, choose an appropriate graph type, and arrange information within the graph appropriately, how it should be arranged. <clears throat> then second is proximal compatibility principle reduces the number of mental operations. And we have already seen this in the uh, case of the line graph. Because of the proximal, proximal compatibility, the inferences can be drawn much faster with the line graph than, you now there can be biases in graph reading and as the information is presented. For example, if we want to present on the dependent axis, information from zero to 100, we can use the entire scale. But suppose we say, okay, in this range, there is uh, you know, hardly anything, and what is important is this. Then I can present the information like that. There's a problem. Because here, I find there is a very small change. And here, it is a very large change. Similarly, for the line graphs. If I, rather than using the entire scale, I use only a limited scale, I show that there is hardly any change. So the marketers generally use this kind of chart. They're called GWIS charts. And GWIS charts are uh, very you know, misguiding. Uh, because they present information in a very small window. And uh, so if uh, an organization wants to say, oh, our share is rising at a very high speed, they'll present it like that. Our losses are very small, 
they will present it like that. So it depends, you know, how they want to use the information and how they want to communicate it to the people. Then data ink ratio, um, the printed on printing, say various amount of ink that should be used. Optimum should be optimum to avoid clutter. Too much of uh, ink ratio will clutter it. And data ink ratio principle is keep to a minimum the amount of ink that does not depict data points. If only try to use only for depicting data points. Then multigraph multigraph query coding variables place quantitative variables on the x-axis. If there is a combination of qualitative quantitative, put quantitative here on the x-axis and qualitative here. If both variables are qualitative, encode important differences two points on the x-axis. One of them may be an important variable. Consistency creates good. So if multiple graphs are to be used, be consistent. If a variable has been used on the x-axis in the first graph, continue with that in the second, third, and next graph. Highlight uh, differences. So if there is something new that has been done, highlight that, that here we have made a change. And highlight that in a certain way by making it darker, changing the color, or whatever have you. Then short and distinct legends should be placed. So here, for example, here short and distinct legends have been placed. Here the legends are outside. So uh, that is uh, you know, the basic guideline. Then altimeter design, three measures, present altitude, predict, predicated value, predicted value, and command altitude. Uh, integrated vertical best are the best designs and fastest to read with least reading error. Integrated circular, separated digital counters, and separated circular, they are more difficult to read. So the best design for altimeter reading is that. Now for this session, you should do some literature review to compare tables. I have not talked about tables and graphs. This distinction is very important because tables also present some information and tables present quantitative information. The only point is if you want to represent, say, trends in the data, tables will not reveal that. A line graph will be better do that job. One question can be, when do you need a table? When should you make a table? Now, generally, tables are used to compare precise values. What is the difference between the what was the difference, for example, on a system, how the temperature differed from one in condition to the other condition? And suppose we want to do that, so we have exact measures of temperature. Now, there are just two positions. Then a table is not needed because a direct comparative statement can be made that in the first condition, the temperature was that, in the second, the condition, and that can be a part of the text. Tables are made because there will be a memory load if there are three or more comparisons. So if we have to indicate temperature under three different conditions, then writing three is OK. But four, even three will be difficult. Four. So if the number of points to be indicated is three or more, it's a good idea to make a table. Because then uh, the information can be quickly read from the table. And then, then there can be comparisons between the tables and the graph. I've already discussed it in the case of the map, for example. But it will be a good idea to go through tables, graphs, and maps, and develop guidelines for that, and identify different cognitive processes involved in reading these displays. And uh, working memory, for example, we have looked at working memory in some places, where we want to make local comparisons, or we want to make even global comparisons then the role of working memory will become important. And the second question is, are books displays? Compare the design implications for and performance implications of printed books, e-books, and books printed in Braille language. So add books. Books printed in Braille language. So Braille language is used, uh, it's a textual language, and uh, where you know people who are uh, 
vision, who have vision problem, uh, who cannot read properly uh, because of the visual uh, problems, then the books printed in Braille language can be read. And you know, through textual contact, these people can know what is written there, what is printed there. And then on the basis of uh, these, uh, you know, uh, you can really see how you can apply whatever we have learned in this particular session. Then we have not talked about auditory and tactual displays. So it will be a good idea to summarize guidelines for designing auditory and tactual displays. So identify what are the different auditory and tactual displays that we use. Most of the time we are using, for example, when we are using a cell phone and when the company says, oh, it's, uh, it's easy to hold or handle, then it's a tactual or feel, it gives a good feel. Uh, uh, you know, so now that the feel is of touch. So that, you know, and similarly for auditory, say sound intensity, etc. We have talked about uh, these characteristics of sound in one of the earlier lectures. So you should now bring back that information and try to develop certain guidelines and also identify different displays, auditory and tactual displays that we use normally in our daily life. Then these are the references uh, where you can see uh, most of the information here and this uh, is useful. Thank you very much for today's session.